everyone, and we should be live. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Weekly Strength Club podcast. Uh, as titled by the lovely Mick Solomons, this is Accessories to Turbocharge Your Deadlift. Um, I'm here with my boy, Chase Lindley. How's it going, Chase? Doing well, guys. How are y'all? Uh, I'm good, Chase, said the audience. Uh, if you're in the comments, sound off for us, please. Um, we also do Q&A during all this stuff. That's why we do it as live, uh, a live stream. Mm-hmm. So if you have any questions, let us know. Uh, Chase, you were up to some cool stuff last weekend, right? Yeah, I had the seminar. Uh, we do this with Starting Strength every other month um, in, in Wichita Falls, Texas. The seminar is basically like the blue book distilled down in the three days. Um, we go over the lectures of why we do things, kind of the first principles. Uh, so kind of give you kind of the itinerary. So, or Friday, we do the introductory kind of little talk that Rip gives. Um, after that is a coaching lecture about what we're actually doing whenever we're coaching. Um, what we're seeing, kind of what is a model, kind of going into those first principles as I stated earlier. You guys do, um, it's squat, bench, dead, Saturday, right? Yep. So yep. we actually do, well, on Friday, we after the, the coaching, we do Rip's strength talk, you know, talking about the His forces, motivational kind of, speech? Yeah, kind of, yeah. right? <laughs> um, how, like, if you're not naturally gifted, just go kill yourself right now. No, I'm mm-hmm. Um, and then a physics talk to wrap up Friday. And then, yeah, Saturday is just a grueling day of, um, squat, squat deadlift, or really the pulling mechanics and our bench. Um, it's going into great detail detail of why we do the low bar squat. That one Um, threw me off the first time, the first time I went and I was like, Oh, it doesn't go squat bench deadlift. It goes squat deadlift bench. I was like, what the, (laughs) I want my money back. This is crazy. Um, we have Andre Fernandez in the chat. This is, he's just, he's just starting us off with a strong question. Um, how do you work around shoulder problems? IE may have torn a rotator cuff. So it hurts to deadlift and bench. Um, that's interesting that it hurts to deadlift. So tension on the shoulder is compromised, which would lead me to think that it's something in the posterior aspect of the shoulder that is a little bit cranky. Um, Yeah, so it's going to be the same procedures for all this stuff. It's going to be modulate load until you find something that's tolerable and then aim to increase that. And if it's not really load dependent, it's more range of motion dependent, cut out whatever portion of the range of motion is irritating and then work up from there. Um, If everything is irritating just across the board, try to play with movement selection past that. Um, You know, having a torn road trader cuff, it's it's kind of super vague, even though it it sounds very specific. Um, So more information there would definitely be helpful. Um, Chase, any thoughts for uh, our boy Andre? Uh, benching is definitely going to piss off your shoulder. Um, I'd try to lighten it as best you can. Maybe again, go into like a closed grip bench, um, or just not bench at all. Just start really pressing, try to get your shoulders strong because at some point, um, you may need to fix this if it's torn and just get your shoulders really strong by pressing before going into this next surgery. Yeah. If you can do something that's comfy, like drive it home. So like if you, if you, let's say if it hurts to overhead press, but you can bench, just bench, you know, and then likely sort itself out over time. Um, you know, invert that too. Um, but yeah, so Chase, you're starting to do more of the talking portions of the seminars, right? How'd that go? Yeah, man, they, they threw a lot at me. Um, so we have the lectures and then basically teaching the teaching method. I did all the teaching methods, the long versions and the short, uh, for every about- lift. Uh, except for the power clean. So That's terrible. Squat. Yeah, I did the squat, what the, 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 the bench, and the, and the press. Uh, That's fine, man. I uh, I suck at talking, so this is making me more strong at it. It's getting me better prepared, and and doing this podcast too helps a lot. But it, it, yeah, at the start, I was I was really rambling. I was really fast, but I could hit all the major points. Good. Um, then you know, as like it goes along in the weekend. I have five people on the squat platform that I can now look at whenever I'm giving the deadlift talk. And then it grows every single time that we're doing a lift. So eventually on whenever we're on the press, uh, I knew everybody in the room and I could, I could easily talk. Nice. That's awesome. Uh, it seems like we got some more people popping in. It seems like we have uh, a dozen or so people. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to let us know. Um, anything, everything. Uh, if the question is what I'm drinking, it is the new Bang Miami Cola by the way, if this decides to focus itself. But Miami Cola, highly recommend it. Um, It looked like a Budweiser from about like this much up. So like if you were holding... No alcohol for me, it's bad for you. Um, But what are we talking about today, Chase? We're talking about deadlift accessories, right? Yeah, so how are we going to get your deadlift from point A to point B? Um, Not deadlifting. I'm joking. Um, (laughs) No, it's just what you need to do now that you've ran your deadlift into a wall or if you kind of see that wall kind of coming at you, uh, we need to do something to help break up the stress, um, get us to where we need to go with our pools and progress them without 
running into a wall. I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, social media. So we have Chase at Chase Lindley and then at Chase underscore Lindley. Follow them both. Send them a message. Um, Chase does online coaching. He's eager for more new clients, especially if you're into bodybuilding. If you want to sculpt and tone, Chase is your boy. Um, you can reach me at acostrengths.com. Um, any inquiries, things like that. Uh, and if you want to get videos on the show, we do a bunch of form checks here as well. You can email those to make at support.strength.club um, and send him your well wishes too. And boop. Here we go. We're going to switch this guy over. Um, so we'll start this with the with the rip quote. You're thinking too hard about this, as always. And it's a very important quote for us to, to remember as we go on into this. Um, but yeah, so so the deadlift, um, it's the simplest lift. If you put someone who's never barbell trained in a room with a barbell, they'll probably pick it up off the ground. There you go. Um, and then press it up over their head. Kind of think of those as the two core lifts for a long time. I really only trained those two whenever training resources were limited. Um, but we're talking about deadlift accessories, which are going to basically be variations on the parent lift which is the deadlift um so we have a bunch of options to go through uh chase what are some of your favorites man i love rack pulls um i love i i should hold on i actually kind of backtrack on that were you I about to gonna, say you love haltings yeah i mean so at the start <laughs> i hated them man I, I i never really did them at the, at the beginning of whenever I, I started kind of going past uh just deadlifting every single workout getting into more advanced uh programming I remember doing haltings maybe like a handful of times out of like five or six years. And then it wasn't until recently whenever I really started pushing them and man, they really do help. And I love just kind of the, the, the volume that it kind of creates with a set of eight instead of a set of five and just the pump you feel whenever you're like pulling, you know, a seven or the eighth rep. It's awesome. Um, and then after that, um, I've dabbled a little bit with some deficits. I like deficits. Um, but it's just, I never really pushed them that hard. Um, I kind of just used them as a bunch of volume and stuff. And it, it does help with setting the low back if you need that area kind of fixated. But at the same time, a halting does the same thing. So I'd rather mm-hmm. just do a halting than a, a halting are Haltings are cool, man. I think they're yeah. they're great position practice. It's almost like the floor yeah, breaker they, drill. Um, just how to set your chest. Uh, comment from Tejo, which was really funny, by the way, Tejo. I, I, good marks for that. Alex, <laughs> you've been active on Reddit again. What's gone wrong in your life that you feel like doing that? That is a very good question. Um, I've been having these conversations with myself. I'm not entirely sure. I got called back to the Reddit by a few people who messaged me saying, hey, there's a bunch of silly bullshit going on. Um, so pop back in to deal with that. Um, we had some people like putting the SSC tagline on the end of their posts who totally are not affiliated with starting strength in any way. Um, so we had to deal with that. A bunch of, a bunch of other silly stuff. Um, I need to corral that in place, but it is... It is treacherous. It is treacherous for sure. Are you the only one who corrals it, Alex? Um, uh, Mary Kunkel is on there occasionally. Kunkel. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how to say that last name out loud. I don't, that's the first time I've tried that. Um, and then they have one or two other mods there who just, you know, uh, like clean up the place if there's any other spam. But it mm-hmm. is, it is, so it's like if the bottom 3% is Rips YouTube, the bottom 50% of that 3%, let's say the bottom 1.5% of the internet population has, has dived into that starting strength thread. Jeez, um, there's a lot of like very earnest posts where it's someone who's like, I'm trying to squat for the first time ever. And then there's also some people who just kind of want to talk about how much stuff they know. So it's a it's it's an interesting mix of people. Um, but yeah, so to run through the options real quick for what are the primary, there's there's a lot of other deadlift variations, but the primary ones that we're going to be discussing today are things like a rack pull, which is a partial range of motion, same thing like a block pull, um, a halting or a pause pull, um, an RDL or a deficit. Um, and then we're going to tackle when to implement them. And then lastly, how to track your responses and then considerations for future programming. Um, so when to implement them, uh, the answer is almost always never too early. So, you know, when you're just starting your lifting career and starting the starting strength NLP, we want you deadlifting every single session. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're deadlifting all those sessions across, just like you are with squats. Um, and we want that to run for as long as it can. Um, you theoretically could do it two times a week, you could do it one time a week, whatever your considerations are. Um, but you have to realize that going inter- into intermediate programming, you want this big well of deadlift conditioning. So you want to be able to handle three, you know, hard sets of week. Um, if you basically, you know, over the first two months, you'd go three times a week, and then you go down to one time a week after that, you end up going in intermediate training, really only being only being able to handle one deadlift set a week. And a lot of times that's just not enough. Um, you know, so we want a lot of deadlifts really frequently. And then whenever that stops working is basically when you go into intermediate programming, and that's when you can start considering, um, 
adding in a deadlift variation. And we'll go to the next one. So we're talking about programming now. Um, Chase, when would you consider adding in a deadlift variation, like these accessories that we're talking about, as opposed to just deadlifting more, but with a different weight on the bar? Um, there's different scenarios. Um, so let's take like you have a kid who or a person who doesn't know how to set their back. Um, I'm actually not going to have them deadlift, but I'm actually going to make them rack pull. Um, that difference in the range of motion allows them to effectively set their back a little bit better. So that's kind of like an outlier in that sense. But um, whenever I see someone struggle with their deadlift, let's say on Monday, uh, I know that Wednesday is it's not going to happen for another PR jump with a, mm -hmm. a set of five. I'm going to lighten a little bit and then kind of let that stress carry over, let them recover. And on Friday, they're going to be good to go for another five pounds. Um, at that point, it depends. Are they kind of sucky with the top half of their pool? Um, or if they're really solid and just they hit a wall of a sudden on that Monday. Um, if the person is sucky, I'm going to make them do a little bit more stressful with a rack pull. Um, get them real comfortable with pulling on something heavy. So that Friday, it's not that big of a shock to them. So there's, prepared. so it's more like considerations around that person's weak points, which yeah, is exactly. a very individual thing. Exactly. Okay. But um, if they're like, if they're just a deadlifting machine, um, yeah, we just need to lighten a little bit and then I'll, I'll make them go, uh, power clean. Or if they can't power clean, we're going to do, you know, a, a, a RDL or something like that. Right. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll take it from top to bottom. Um, and then I'll give my answer to the question I just asked Chase as well. Um, so the things we're going to cover frequency considerations, how much you should be deadlifting just in general. Um, does anthropometry or really like fatigue costs change your frequency consideration? Um, what your considerations are for determining volume and then how to distribute your intensity. So like, let's say if you want to do singles or doubles or triples, or if you want to do a set of eight, like you did with the halting. Um, and then relevance to your goal, like what are you going for? Are you going for max single because you got a powerlifting competition coming up? Or are you you really want to just work on your single for some reason, or are you trying to max a big set of five um, and then really kind of introducing accessories? Cause I think that, you know, that question is rele relevant to all of them. Um, so for frequency considerations, like we talked about with the novice, um, you want to be deadlifting as frequently as you can get away with. Eventually in your career, you can't deadlift super frequently um, unless you are either sandbagging the loads across or you're working at like a relatively low intensity or RPE. Um, Chase, you're, you're a heavy deadlifter. How many times a week would you deadlift during a deadlift block? Um, currently right now I'm only pulling once that is yep. heavy um, and you're pulling the from the floor just in general between a snatch, clean, high pull, whatever, how many times, uh, about five days of pulling. Mm -hmm. five yeah. Days of pulling. Yeah. So it's a lot. So just like with the rest of it, oh, yeah. we talked about with this, like with the bench and things like that before, like frequency tends to go up as we need more demands because you have to fill out that volume. Um, but like if it's a heavy deadlift, so like, let's say when you were working up to your 700 pound deadlift, how often mm -hmm. were you taking out limit deadlifts? Uh, probably every three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every that's, weeks. that's very far apart. And a lot of people yeah, think that, definitely. you know, you'll lose like top end strength by doing that. Um, why wouldn't you lose out on strength by only, uh, pulling a heavy, heavy lift, let's say once every three weeks. Dude, it's just, the deadlift impacts you so much to where you are able to use so much muscle mass, all of your body in the lift. And it's generally always heavier than your squat. So this lift is so special in the sense that you can get away with doing one set of five and yet fuck yourself up for, for a while until you have to recover. Um, in my case for three weeks until you're ever, you're ready to pull again. Um, so not so much with like a rack pull and a, and a halting because of the, the differences in the range of motion, but a true deadlift. Um, yeah, you can get away in the sense of not doing it as much once you're advanced. Oh, shout out to Nick. Nick's in the chat. Hey, uh, how's it going, Nick? Um, but, uh, but he was the one who asked the cat or dog question last time. That's what was going on with that. Um, but yeah, so uh, basically frequency considerations is that like the deadlift is so ubiquitously taxing that you can get away with a relatively lower frequency. And let's say he was deadlifting once every three weeks. He has to kind of pad those intervals between every three weeks with other things. And then that's kind of the position for either lighter deadlifts or in this case, like positional work, like a halting or a paused RDL or a block pull or something like that. Um, so that's all that stuff to consider. Um, in terms of volume considerations, I would say those come down to uh, each of the individual 
individual accessory movements. So like an RDL is going to have a different volume consideration than like a block pull wheel. And we'll go over that in a little bit. Um, same thing with distribution of intensity. Um, and then relevance to goal. Uh, Chase, when would you say that it's appropriate for people to kind of switch to like measuring their deadlift in different ways? You know, so like at some point in your career, you cared more about your deadlift single than you did care about your uh, deadlift set of five. Hmm. Um, that can be a personal answer yeah, or do you think for general? I, I've always been the type of person that I want my numbers to go up any way possible. Um, I'm not really particular about, oh, look, I pulled, you know, uh, my best set of five was at like 625. Like th- I think of that as like a, a mini goal or like mm-hmm. a mini boss versus like the final boss is like 700, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's cool. And I, I, I'll always have that, but I'm, I'm looking to pull the max ever that I'm possibly can. And that's, you know, the one at max, that's me pulling 700. Yeah. I've noticed this with a lot of people, basically, whenever they get near plate and landmarks, they'll switch their thinking from a set of five to a single. So they'll pull like 365 for five. And they're like, you know what? I really want to pull 405 for a single. And then that can yeah. go from four to 500, five yep. to six, all that, all that stuff. Um, Erg in the chat, finally catching one of these live. That's our fault, man. We don't do this on as a normal schedule as I think we should. Um, we had some questions in the chat. Uh, we'll start with Andrew. Um, Andrew, is there a particular anthropometric uh, configuration that will cause your knees to be completely behind your arms and elbows at the deadlift start position? Um, I would say no. Chase, what say you? No, yeah. I think it's if it's probably a person who has a long torso, they can kind of manipulate that a little bit better by adjusting their feet and their toe angle on their setup. But I, I hardly ever see that problem. I mean, maybe if like someone had like really, really short arms, like, you know, femur length, or I'm sorry, forearm length, arms, and just really long legs. But that's, I don't know. Yeah, you'd have to think on the extremes there, like incredibly short arms, much longer legs. Like a T-Rex almost. Exactly, yeah. So I think the optimal or the the more optimal shin angle will always be inclined in such a way where the arms will almost always be in contact with them some way, somehow. Um, The two-second coaching model that I use for the deadlift is just kind of make sure those knees are basically almost right at the elbows for the deadlift. Mm -hmm. And then that person's shoulders are likely in a good enough position to do some amount of the pull. Um, But I don't think there's really anything where... Unless you're doing like a stiff like a deadlift, if the goal is to do an SLDL, you know, get the get the legs behind the arms completely. Um, but otherwise, no. Um, and we got another question from Pete in the chat here. Uh, he says he has a few lifters that really have trouble using a belt while deadlifting. Any tips on belts while pulling in general, preventing the belt from moving if it's too loose or from issues setting the back if it's too tight? What do you think, Chase? I have some issues with that um, with people all the time. It's not the same as you would cinch it down with a squat. Like on a squat, you can cinch it down pretty tight. Uh, press the same thing deadlift is, or i'm sorry a bench the same thing but with a uh, deadlift since you're leaning over and essentially putting your torso into a more horizontal position it's going to cram in between where your thighs and your stomach are um, i have people lo- loosen up just a notch and put the belt up a little bit higher to where the crease of the belt isn't digging into like their uh, their hip flexors or the top of their quads and that usually fixes it a lot i've seen people turn around the buckle to where like um the end of the belt and the buckle are on their back and it's not pinching them. And there's kind of some tricks and tips that you can do. Um, But the majority of it is just don't get it as tight. Yeah. Yeah. One notch looser, um, hot take, soft belt, Velcro belts. They don't pinch anything. (laughs) Um, it can still give the person the mental comfort of having a belt. Um, you know, it's, they can still brace into it somewhat. It's not going to cut mm-hmm. them up. Um, what I would say though, is that this is a very adipose dependent issue for sure. Um, like my very lean lifters, they very rarely complain about belt tightness on the deadlift. My chunky guys, yeah. they do for sure. Um, you know, so like you may be trying to work on an optimal belt configuration for someone's deadlift and there just may not be one. You know, because like no matter what they do, when they jam themselves in that position, their stomach's pushing up against their thighs. Anything that's in the way is going to be uncomfortable. Um, Yeah. Uh, But yeah, thanks for the question, guys. Andrew and Pete, questions are always good from them. Andrew tries to throw some curveballs at me. Oh, yeah. He does. Andrew, Andrew likes those questions. Um, all right. So where were we here? We were talking about relevance to the goal, like what people really consider the, the, the prize of the deadlift. The deadlift is kind of a big single. I've noticed for the squat, people really like sets of five for the squat. Really? More so than heavy singles, I think. I think heavy singles in the squat are just so 
ri- ridiculously taxing that people like rep PRs I think, on the I squat. I think it's more of a mental thing because like with the deadlift, you really can stop at any point. But like on a squat, man, you and the bar are in for a fucking ride. Yeah, you can, you, there's no way to stop halfway through it. Yeah, you're gonna get you're gonna get crushed if you decide. Yeah, so it's like a set of five. You know, you can always rack it at rep four and be like, oh, that was a good, that was still a good yeah. PR. You know, but like a heavy single on the squat, you you have to finish it basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll get on to introducing accessories, and then if so, which. Um, and then this was the, the part of this, you know, to get back to the choosing positions to work on. Um, so Chase said some insightful stuff earlier that uh, the accessories that he tends to go for um, are almost always positional work for the lifter um, in relationship to where they need stress applied. So I've noticed that whenever people do have, like, relatively weak positions, um, applying more stress in that area or just giving them more practice tends to solve that issue. So, like, for example, if someone just basically mentally taps out as the bar is approaching their knees, they're like, I've tried all of the amount of try I have, putting in a block pull right around their knee, that tends to, you know, be really mentally helpful for some people. Um, And the same thing with deficits. Like if people basically, they have the strength for it. If they can do rep one, they can do a set of five. But like with a deficit, if the bar is almost always stuck on the floor for you, try a deficit, you'll be able to handle a lighter load. And then a normal deadlift will feel like a partial pull after you've familiarized yourself with the deficit. Um, Chase, do you want to just tackle these in order with me? What do you think about the rack pull and the block pull? Yeah. Um, These are probably my go-tos are definitely rack pulls. Um, cause again, you start out with such a high intensity, but due to the, the lack of range of motion, cause we've cut it in half, um, it's a lot easier. And how many sets and reps, by the way, are you thinking for these guys? Oh, just one set of five. Um, mm-hmm. hardly anything more than that. Um, if it's a woman, you know, two sets of three type thing, but, um, never anything more than a set of five or, or if it's equivalent with a female. Um, I, I go to this because usually what I tend to see is, you know, those few sessions that we're getting into with the deadlift um, before it completely stalls, like the back starts to really round at the top. Um, locking out is a little bit more stressful than getting it off the floor. The majority of the time people can get it off the floor. And then once it starts getting real heavy, it's off the floor, it, the bar doesn't move. Um, so I rather them just kind of get a little bit more lockout strength, um, getting them comfortable with something heavier than they are picking up, you know, on Monday uh, in their hands on Wednesday. And it's not going to tax them because, again, because of the range of motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gives you an opportunity to practice and play around with heavier weights. And the shorter range of motion can reduce some of the fatigue cost. So Mm -hmm. it's like it's a win-win because like there are a lot of people who, you know, even a five pound jump on something that you know they can do. And that may be like a big mental thing for them. Um, So being able to like taste and just to sample a weight before you actually take it from the floor is super helpful. You know, Um, like if you've never touched 500 before. You know, and you're on the cliff from, you know, let's say 475 and you want to try 500 a little bit later on for a single, um, that can be nerve wracking, you know? So like a rack pull is a really good way to, to experience those things. Uh, and then we'll go to our, the RDL next, actually, uh, before we move on, um, volume considerations for the rack pull, um, fatigue cost can really sneak up on you. So what Chase said mm-hmm. for a single set of five or two sets of three, depending on who it is, very salient point. Um, you don't want to go overboard on the volume with the rack pulls because it can just crush you, you know, um, like you're mm-hmm. not getting um, a tremendously high stimulus because the range of motion is really short. You're really relying on that weight to help drive adaptation. Um, so like, is there going to be a huge difference between five reps at 110% of your deadlift versus, you know, seven or eight or 10 from two sets of five? Not terribly much, you know, the fatigue cost can get away from you. Um, so keep reps a little bit lower, I would say. Um, volume, volume definitely lower than a normal deadlift. Um, the RDL, uh, this, uh, relates to one of our guys' questions. Um, Hey, he said, just got you live. Uh, he's doing an intermediate program from Dr. Sullivan for older lifters, probably from the barbell prescription, really good book. Check it out. And um, it calls for deadlift just once a week and chin ups once a week on the light day. Um, he is stuck at a certain weight on the deadlift for around a month. He was supposed to do three reps, then four reps, then five. Um, and then after that increased weight and titrate up from three to five reps again. Um, we've seen his deadlift form before and it's pretty good. Should he add an RDL, uh, with some lightweight? What do you think, Chase? I think that's the problem. You're trying to go light to fix the problem. Um, so this kind of ties in with the other lifts as well. Uh, think of it as the press, right? You wouldn't lighten the load on the press because you've already started out with the lighter weight. Now it may not seem like that on a deadlift because again, the deadlift starts out pretty heavy, but if it's not progressing, going lighter and adding lighter movements isn't going to help it. You need to get more efficient at pulling on heavier shit. Um, rack pulls, like what we're talking about, 
doing, um, you know, maybe singles now on your deadlift. You don't have to do this kind of set program with threes, fours, and fives because out of those three weeks, you're pulling the same load. And yes, it's getting a little bit more stressful because of the number of reps are increasing, but I think you may need to just stick to triples, doing one set of three and then adding weight to the bar may be the key to, to this instead of um, trying to add volume every single time that you're pulling. Um, again, it just, it's not the same amount of stress um, as it is just adding weight to the bar. And granted, I'm going to say that you're an older individual, so volume isn't going to be your friend. Um, just keep the volume light and just keep hounding at the intensity. I'd be interested to see where you think you're failing at uh, on the deadlift. Because essentially you're doing three reps, then four reps, then five reps. So every three weeks you're hitting your most stressful deadlift. Um, so I would be very hard pressed to believe that once you reset to the next set of uh, three reps, you just can't break it off the floor. So let's say you're deadlifting 255 for five. You should be able to do 260 for a few reps after there. So I'd be curious as to where you think that you're you're failing at um, uh, Chipave Chipeve. I'm not trying to say that name. Um, I think that would be really informative. But apparently we saw your deadlift before, but I'm having a hard time remembering what it is. Um, I think RDLs probably aren't the best option because I would assume you're getting stuck on the floor. Um, the RDLs seem to help people, you know, maintain position from the top. Um, he said it went three, four, then back to two. Um, mm. Yeah, so I would just make sure that it's not a fluke. Try to try to tease out if it's a trend or a fluke. Um, we've talked about that before on some programming episodes. Um, if you think you just had a bad day, which everybody has, um, try to reset a week or two and then you know go from there um, or just make the appropriate modifications going forward. Um, I would say you're already operating on super low volumes because there are some weeks that you're just doing three, you know, three reps of a deadlift, which means that you're relying on the squat to drive that deadlift a lot. Um, in that case, I think, you know, uh, going like deadlift, uh, chin up and then a heavier version of a deadlift or more deadlifts like Chase was saying. Um, you can probably do that on like a Monday, Friday, uh, chin up Wednesday for a routine. Um, but it's all really contextual, I would say. Yeah, that, there, that's there's a lot. There's a lot to these questions because, I mean, it could be your squat. Your squat could be taxing you to where you can get a mm -hmm. threes and fours. Yeah. But fives are just your squat is becoming too taxing. Uh, there's just like what Alex was saying, look at all the variables if you can. Um, making sure that all the variables that you can control are within your grasp. And if it's something else, then you need to um, find a coach, you know? Mm -hmm. coach. Yeah. Programming consultations take an amount of time for a reason because there's yeah. a lot of stuff you need to figure out. Um, Andre Fernandez uh, had another question. Any cues you recommend on rack pulls to prevent driving with your butt like a squat? Chase, what do you think? Push from your quads, man. Fill it in your toes and basically – the back doesn't do any lifting, right? I always use like the analogy of like your human crane. Uh, the arm of the crane is your back. The chains are your arms. All the motors are your legs. So use your legs and just stand up with it. It's making me think here, Andre, that if your butt is shooting up on the rack pole, it was probably too low to start. You know, um, kind of similar thing to the deadlift. Like if we see the hips rise immediately before the bar moves, that's generally a good indicator that the hips were just too low in the first place. Um, so they're arriving at their terminal position. And once they arrive to their terminal position, then the back moves. Um, so check that, check that out. All the cues that Chase said were golden on that one. Um, yeah, so the, the RDL um, and the SLDL, the stiff-legged deadlift or the Romanian deadlift, um, Starting Strength YouTube has some great uh, uh, videos on the, on the RDL. Um, of which your boy Chase is featured in. Um, Chase, do you ever use the stiff-legged deadlift as a variation? I don't think I ever have. Okay. Um, I really like it for people who are just trying to put some meat on the hamstrings and the glutes. Like it's good. It's It lightens the weight up a ton, especially if you're using like a, a long eccentric, so a long or like a slow tempo on the way down. Um, and if you do it, you know, for six months and during a weight gain phase, that person will definitely put some mass on in appropriate areas. Um but the RDL, uh, when would you go for an RDL as opposed to something like a rack pull, Chase? Um, if the lifter is really efficient at their deadlift, and again, uh, he just stalls just on Monday, and I know that he doesn't need any uh, areas of work with his lockout or his bottom position, but he just needs to lighten the overall stress that he's getting with his pulls, an RDL satisfies that. I'm playing with the screen here. All right, I figured it out. 
Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think that the the RDL, it's like, hey, we just want to touch, uh, we want to touch some more work. We need some more work with hip extension, but we don't want to crush you with super heavy weights. Um, the deficit, uh, I really like the deficit pull. I have a ton of people do it, um, especially because most people, they get like mentally spooked out with heavier weights right off the floor. Um, so it's like, hey, if I can have you pull close to your working weight on like a two inch deficit, the normal bottom position feels like a short pull, you know? Um, Chase, are you guys doing deficits over there? In OKC? No, um, I, I have a little bit more of an older crowd, so I'm mm-hmm. not going to have them deficit. And uh, my younger kids, they're not doing it. But me personally, yeah, I, I loved that whenever I was doing deficits because it felt once I was doing a normal deadlift, getting in position was really easy. It almost felt like the bar was three inches higher on my shin. Well, it yeah, kind of was <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. A good deficit block. And then you just go back to a normal pull and you're like, damn, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is crazy. Um, yeah. So pause pulls between like a, a halting deadlift, which is, you know, a, basically a partial, you pull it up off the floor to a determined length and then you sit it back down. Um, and then like a standard pause pull is whenever you pick it up off the floor a little bit, pause there and then finish the rep. Um, Chase, you were, you were raving about the halting deadlift before. How do you feel about them? I like them. Um, they, kind of satisfy what I was talking about with the deficits or with getting your back set and making sure that you're hang you're hanging on to that low back extension. Um, now you just kind of do it in a little bit more specified area with just the range of motion. Whereas a deficit you're standing up all the way, um, including that other added range of motion, but with haltings, um, I don't know, I guess it's because there's a little bit of, um, some nuance to it because I haven't really trained it that much. Uh, I just, I really like them now. I think that I kind of just shitted on them a little bit too much at the start, <laughs> and now it's kind of coming back to bite me in my ass. Uh, but yeah, like I was saying with the set of eight, um, it really gets you attached to setting a low back, um, for just, it feels like forever because it's a set of eight. Yeah. Excellent position drill. It's very similar to like a floor breaker drill. If you just look like floor breaker deadlift, um, you know, those are, it, it's very similar to that. You know, we're working on squeezing the chest position up, breaking the bar off the floor, maintaining that position. Um, for programming considerations for deficits, you can program them really just like a normal deadlift. They'll be a little bit more stressful. So you take some appropriate weight off the bar. Don't run them just as heavy because people just tend to lose back extension uh, to get the bar moving. Um, you know, take 15, 20% off from a normal working weight and hit your deficits for pause pulls um lighter than you think and i would say higher reps for sure like you should really not be doing you know a one rm pause pull you're not doing a one rm halting you know um you're doing it for higher reps tack it into a period of time where that it's not going to interfere too much with another lift so maybe at the end of the week um it's a good place to put them um but like a few maybe you know two one to four sets i would say anything past that's probably a little overkill for most people um, and you can work with higher reps. Um, here's some, yeah, some other ones that are a little bit more, a little more niche grip changes, like a snatch grip deadlift. You ever playing with those chase? And you are cause you're snatching. Yeah. But. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. I do snatch grip, but, uh, whenever I was not doing the Olympic lifts, no, I think I did maybe snatch grip deadlifts once or twice. Um, uh, mm-hmm. I, I was reading, uh, Bill Kazmar's, um, I think article about how to grow his monster traps. He did like <laughs> just ripped some, them off. It was some stupid shit of like he did like four sets of twenty with snatch grip shrugs yeah. or something. I'm like, dude, that is insane. Like, damn, I want to try that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, I just did it for like a work, and I was like, oh, this is stupid. I really don't need this. <laughs> Um, yeah, so snatch grip effectively what it does is it shortens the arm. So if you're looking at someone from the front and you think of a triangle, think of a triangle that's like very narrow and it can be pretty tall. But if you think of one that's really wide, I guess like maybe this angle is more appropriate. If you think of one that's really wide, that triangle is going to get shorter. Um, you know, so if you have your arms all the way out towards the collars, your range of motion is going to be way longer on the pole because your arms can be pretty short. Um, so it will lighten the load up and increase the hip height. Um, so kind of back to Andrew Travis's question, um, it'll put you in a position, you know, where the, the hips are really high. Um, you know, the snatch grip is a way to lighten up load on the bar. Uh, other grip changes you can do, if someone normally pulls hook grip, have them pull over under. Have them pull double overhand. If someone normally pulls over under, have them pull hook grip. Um, you know, we want to be resilient in a good amount of positions, and you can use it as a tool to pull some weight off the bar to get some volume work in. Um, so, you know, like let's say, for example, if your one by five progression is stalled on your deadlift and you want to add in like a three by five on Friday with like 80% loads, um, you can use go back to double overhand grip 
you know, it'll still feel really hard because you're using double overhand grip again, but now you can get in some extra, extra sets and reps. Um, same thing with modifying the grip elsewhere. Um, uh, one thing that I've noticed is like if a double overhand grip or to me, if an over under grip is looking like it's going to start running out, you can introduce a hook grip on those accessory or the, on the lighter days. That way they can practice it. And um, because what you don't want to have to do is say, hey, the only way you're going to be able to pull, you know, 565 is if you switch to a different grip, you have to learn it now. Yeah. Um, you want you want to get ahead of those things. Um, uh, and then other back work we have like, you know, back extensions, uh, GHD. Are there any other notable back uh, accessory movements that you think help the deadlift? Mm, I've seen people do dumbbell rows and stuff. This is more of like the exotic, like sexy, sleek shit that everyone kind of looks for. Um, but the problem with those is that they are exhaustible pretty fast. Um, I mean, how heavy can you really get like your a back extension? Um, how heavy can you do a one arm row? And, you know, all this shit's just kind of like um, the cherry on top of the Sunday with all your other stuff that you can do with a barbell. Yeah, it's a they're they get increasingly less specific whenever you're not just picking up a heavy weight by itself. Mm-hmm. Um, what you'll see is it's like okay, so let's say for example, if you dedicate you know and you do nine sets of some additional rowing work a week, um, and then you just you know do that for two years, and then by the end of that two years, you have like another three and a half four pounds of lat to pull with. That's helpful for a deadlift, you know, um, but you're not going to see anything in the short term. Um, mm-hmm. You're not going to be like, oh, I added in some extra dumbbell rows in my deadlift skyrocketed. I added 40 pounds in 12 weeks. Um, it's going to be like long term changes to muscle mass, which help reflect your actual pull. Um, we got anything else here? Um, yeah. So just to, we could cover some back extension stuff again. We covered this in the in the recent episode, uh, right? Two episodes so. ago? Yeah. Okay. So. All right, cool. Um, we're going to pull up some deadlift videos now and then get through some form checks. If anybody in the chat has some questions, shout them out. Um, I'm going to put Chase. Chase, you're going to be the big head. All right. Uh, um, I actually, I actually kind of wanted to point out something too. So I think we talked about it earlier. Um, so out of those movement considerations, if you are the person that struggles with a deadlift, right, going lighter isn't going to help you. Just like what I was telling Hamim, um, I don't know how to say his last name, but um, if you struggle with a deadlift and making it lighter doesn't help. Um, yes, it's true that the deadlifts need uh, to break up their stress throughout the whole entire week. But if you're, you know, struggling with 315, um, it's that's really not that heavy of a pull. So you need to find a way to increase it without taxing the shit of yourself there we um, go. With, with a particular movement pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Consider weight on the bar and then why you're actually failing the rep. You know, like, are you completely unable to break it off the floor? Are you mentally just stopping the pull early? That's a huge one that a lot of people do that they don't realize they're doing. Um, you know, like while where the actual failure is coming from and then move to it just from there. And um, we're going to go through a bunch of deadlifts and then some other form check videos. And we saw Aaron here pressing last week. Um, Chase called him very meaty. So hopefully that trend continues. He, he stays as meaty this week. Um, I think he's pulling 505 in this one. Um, this is just a really good example of back extension. I just wanted to show everybody this. It's if we pause it, you know, as he's getting set up. Um, so he's followed the five step set up really religiously here. The shins are inclined. He hasn't rocked back or forward on the ankles and the back is rounded and that's totally fine for right now. And what we're going to see is all these wrinkles form in the back of his shirt. He's going to aim his chest up at the wall in front of him and then keep his butt nice and high. Yep. Pull, pull, pull. And he's back down. I think the knees may be a little bit soft here on the finish. What do you think? Yeah. Just? Yeah. I think he's overdoing it with the hip extension at the top. Yeah. Um, he needs to just lock out a little bit harder with his legs. Mm-hmm. And then they both explode is what's going to happen. Um, no, deadlifting is very safe. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really like these. I think this is a good example of pulling the slack out of the bar as well. Um, nice chest up slack pulled. Yeah. Solid, solid. Good. Yeah, this is just a normal deadlift. We'll start with a normal deadlift, and we'll move on to some other variations. Um, Chase, keep talking about stuff. Um, so as we saw there, um, so let's go back to like that one dude's question about how uh, I think it was his hip height and how relative his knees are with his arms. Oh, Andrew's so, Andrew's question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So with yeah. this guy, like we'll just talk about anthropometry as Alex is finding the next video here. Uh, Andrew is not built like a weirdo, so he can have a really good, <laughs> efficient pulling positions, right? But let's say if someone is... Uh, yeah, this is right off the floor. So we paused this maybe two inches off the floor. Mm-hmm. So if someone mm-hmm. it has really long legs, right, and they have almost like their ass is higher than their, their shoulders, up here, that's yeah. also a problem, right? Yeah, yeah, so then 
their have their hips and their low back have to do a little bit more work and they're not getting enough legs out of it. So now we're kind of manipulating the criteria a little bit. So we have to find a way with adjusting the stance to kind of help artificially shorten the legs here. Um, what I have people do is widening out the toes, kind of externally rotate the, the femur a little bit um, since their knees are tracking their toes and that usually solves that problem. Now, if someone has a really long torso and short legs like that, um, we're not gonna have them at such a severe angle because, um, or actually we may, it just kind of depends. Um, usually I don't see anyone having a really severe toe angle like that. If they have a long torso, um, usually they're good at just, you know, setting up and making sure that they can pull. What do you think you want to see next? We got some RDLs, pause pulls, rack pulls. What do you want? Mm, I think rack pulls. I All right. We'll, see, we'll check some rack pulls out. I think I have, I have two rack pulls right now. I like the big head chase, by the way, whenever we're watching that, that's always good. Okay. Um, Rack pulls, uh, I'm going to say this is 375 or so, and then this guy's body weight is, he's almost at 170 right now. Um, I think the shoulders may be a little bit forward on this one. Um, but yeah, so the rack pull, uh, it's almost always set up inside of a power rack. Um, that's why we call them rack pulls. Um, it, you know, in the Olympic lifting circle, a partial pull is almost always called a block pull because they're pulling them off of wooden deadlifting blocks. Mm. Um, so it's just a terminology thing, but if you hear block pulls or rack pulls, they're basically the same exact thing. Um, now, this is higher than his actual deadlift is by like 40 pounds or so. Um, Chase, what do you think about this rack pull? Um, what I normally see with people is that they set up too close. Now, this is a terrible angle to really tell, but I can kind of see that his shins are almost vertical. Your shins should not be vertical on a rack pull. They could be slightly bent to allow some knee extension to happen off the floor. It's not going to be much, mm -hmm. um, but we still need knee extension, right? And you can kind of see that he rocks back to kind of get himself into a little bit more favorable position to where he's reducing that moment arm on his back and he's trying to push and get his shoulders up as quickly as possible. We need, again, to take a step back a little bit and push from the toes with the rack pull. Those are kind of the common errors that I see with the rack pull. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only other thing I'm seeing here uh, is that the, the, the supine hand is a little bit too far out, I think. Yeah. Um, he could just be totally used to that, and he may not know this at all. That maybe That's probably a longer-term change to work on. Um, but yeah, so what Chase was saying about the rack pull is that we don't want the shins to be completely vertical. Because if the shins are completely vertical, what you'll notice is that the bar, when they start, is like at their knee or above their knee. Okay. Unless you're doing like very specific overloaded strongman tasky stuff, I, the programming utility of like a, an above the knee rack pull, I think is really limited. Um, mm -hmm. So if the shins are already totally vertical, you've gone too far. You know, yeah. you want the you want the bar to be a few inches, you know, four to five inches higher than your normal deadlift. Keep it a little bit below the knee. The shins will still be inclined for sure. Um, we got some more questions. Uh, one from our boy Pete. Uh, do short femur, longer torso folks usually exhibit more incline in the back angle? Um, you want to cue their hips higher, but their anthropometry doesn't accommodate. Um, Chase, you go first. Yeah, you're pretty much right. Um, fear, uh, you know, people like this are usually kind of Asians. And whenever you look at the Asians, whenever they weightlift and stuff, um, their hips, maybe they can be a little bit higher from where our standpoint is, but um, the majority of the time, yeah, their shoulders are going to be drastically higher than their ass. And it's just to accommodate them being in the proper position where their shoulders are over the bar and, or rather in front of the bar and that the bar is over the midfoot and mm -hmm. they're able to pull. Yeah, Pete. Yeah. The, it's like, man, I wish I had that build just like, a, like you're, you're built like an otter. Basically you just have this long tube torso yeah. and very short legs. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, excellent squatters. Um, this is Tracy here. Tracy's doing a rack pull. We'll talk about her rack pull. Then we'll move on. We'll find some RDLs or something like that. Um, this is a pretty light one. This is a pretty light one for her, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think one I've, more rep I've here. never one more rack, rack pulled off yep. of straps like that. Have you ever done that? Um, if you can find a groove, um, like it kind of depends on the level of the floor. Nobody's floor is really level, um, but like the the straps will sit in a in a in a spot. And you basically, mm -hmm. I have people get a marker and just ch chalk out or marker out that spot so they know where the bottom is. If you can find that, it's totally fine. But if you're if you're kind of rolling against it, it's terrible. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so this is another version of a rack pull. Um, yeah, with, with Tracy, we're basically alternating rack pull, deadlift, rack pull, deadlift, um, just because she's still learning the positions. Um, 
and do uh, just basically to accommodate a little bit more weight in the hands. Um, but I really like these back extensions totally fine. Um, what you'll see is like, it looks like there's, you know, rounding in like the thoracic spine, but there's really not what you're looking for is movement in the spine, not necessarily like terminal position, you know, um, in most normal circumstances. Um, we got a few more questions while I let this play. I think, I'm, how do I loop this? Okay, um, here we go. Next question from Resident Wizard, Melchior. Uh, completely failed my deadlift the other day. Got two out of five reps. Previous deadlift session was not brutally hard even. How can I assess if it was due to lack of stress or recovery? Um, I'll go first on that one. Uh, you know, Google the first three questions, Mark Ripito, excellent article. Um, figure out, you know, if you fit into one of those three categories, you may and you may not realize it. Um, the next thing, uh, go check out some of our programming episodes. We talk about how to determine if it was like a fluke or if it's a trend. Um, you know, if it's just a random one-off, don't put too much uh, weight in it. Just, you know, carry on with your life. Um, if it's a trend and you're noticing that deadlifts are getting harder and harder, your attention, you'll likely need some sort of programming intervention to change up what you're doing. Um, what do you think, Chase? Yeah, I agree. Um, you can kind of really see if it is a lack of recovery because you'll soon find out, oh, look, I only ate lunch that day. I probably need to eat a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. So those that is kind of a really quick assessment of uh, I know what I did wrong and I know what to fix. With uh, lack of you know stress, that's a little bit different. Um, you know, you could be thinking that, you know, I'm, I'm pulling hard enough on a thing. Uh, you know, I'm pulling um, three days a week. I'm still adding five, but maybe you just need more tens or you need to find a way to uh, get your rack pull in there to where you're overloading the movement. You're doing halting, um, just like what we were talking about at the beginning of this podcast. Yeah. And try to place it within the week too. So if you, if you failed a deadlift, let's say on Monday, and then, you know, last time you had deadlift was like the previous Wednesday, we know that you had a long period of time in between those bouts of deadlifting. And it would be a little bit more, it would be curious if you failed from, from lack of recovery in that situation. But like, let's say for example, you deadlifted Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And on Friday, your deadlift sucked. We have more culpable reasons. We can mm -hmm. say, Hey, recovery probably isn't, you know, where it should be at that point. It's, it's not really a hole you can eat out of at that point. It's more like you just need need more time or you need to adjust your loading calls on Friday. Um, so maybe put in a lighter deadlift slot on Friday because you're carrying fatigue from two squat sessions and two deadlift sessions if you're still in the LP. I'm not sure if you are. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely consider where you're placing that within the week. Um, uh, Chase, you want to get this one? I'm going to find another video for us. John Gloria, I keep pulling my hamstring when deadlifting. Am I doing something wrong? John, uh, I like the, uh, the dictation there, by the way. That was very question-like. <laughs> That was um, very reading rainbow esque of you, Chase. Yeah, um, John, we, you got to send in a, a video. We don't know what you're setting. I mean, you could be setting up wrong. You could be jerking the hell out of the bar. Um, you could just be doing something completely not looking like a deadlift. Um, we don't know. Just send in a video. Yeah, man. Yeah. Send in a video support at strength.club. Um, if you keep pulling your hamstring when deadlifting, you know that you have like a relatively sensitive hamstring. Um, you know, for your given technique. So what you can do is move to reduce loading on the hamstring. So you could have like a more neutral back position. Maybe you could reduce the range of motion. Um, you could take some weight off the bar. You just need to figure out how to train productively while not continually re-aggravating the area. Um, you know, so it's, it's almost certainly a programming thing, unless for some reason you are doing the stiffest leg deadlifts in the whole world. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to look at some RDLs now. Um, it's our boy Vince here. Uh, he's doing some volume work on the RDL. Uh, one thing to know on the RDL, a lot of people start these from the rack. You don't need to. It's a submaximal deadlift. You can just pick it up off the floor. Um, oh, John, he sent a video in. Uh, we'll have to check it out, man. There's a there's a queue for videos. So if it's in there, we'll, we'll get to it at some point, John. Um, but yeah, so we're watching an RDL do here. Uh, the thing I would, I would recommend Vince changes here is the head position. Like the head position is staying really upright, even at the bottom. So he's ending up in that position where he's, his neck is really craned up. Um, anything else you're seeing here, Chase? I like his toes turned out a little bit, but so what Triangle were you saying about yeah. you, you don't like people starting it off the racks? Um, yeah, because the walking it backwards part is just really cumbersome. Like if you've done an RDL with like over 275, it's just kind of awkward to walk backwards doing the little yeah. shuffle. Um, so like it's a submaximal deadlift, so you can just pick it up, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, Most so of the time I have I have people doing like really light RDLs, so I just have them take it out of the rack, like 85 pounds. Yeah, they can do it in the parking oh. list, walk it all the way out to their car, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I don't want them to, you know, <laughs> that hassle of them <laughs> – taking up all the tins we only have like two sets of tins ah, yes. diameter mm -hmm. yeah so i just i have them in the rack yeah going out of it 
I really love the RDL. I, a lot of my deadlift blocks are built off of the RDL almost as a primary. It's just it's just really good for me with the with the sports stuff that I do. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just it's just not as crushing. You can still get a big hit of stimulus without you know crushing yourself under super heavy weights. Um, and then we have one more RDL video, and we have a question at the same time. Um, Chase, you answer this question first. You'll love this question. <laughs> Mister Doctor Sir, are there good accessories for sumo? Asking for a friend. <laughs> uh, yeah, you need to be conventionally deadlifting, and I think Teo actually said that. Um, man, I, you know, you, you know, our standpoint of why we do not like sumo, um, you know, uh, find a way to make it harder, um, uh, without beating yourself up is kind of the main premise here. Yeah. I think that, so Tejo's advice here, by the way, conventional deadlift, it's unironically good advice. Um, yeah. you know, the conventional deadlift, it's kind of like the RDL to sumo, you know, um, it's a long range of motion. You're getting really bent over a ton of work on the glutes and hamstrings and all that stuff. Um, you know, so like if you're doing sumo a few times a week and you're like, wow, this is getting really stale, mix it up with the deadlift variation that could be conventional. Um, you know, uh, it could be RDLs something like, uh, uh, Corinne is doing here with the RDL. Um, so you just gotta, you just gotta figure out where you think, um, a relative weakness is, you know? Um, but yeah, so this is, this is, uh, this is Corinne. She's, or you'll notice with people who are more flexible, um, they can get a ton of range of motion on the RDL. I'm one of these people included like a RDL where I tap the bar on the floor feels too short to me. So I'll stand on a plate to do them, you know? She's um, mean, dude. Yeah, man, it's it's the life of the athlete, the this athlean X. Um, but yeah, so I always almost stand on a plate to do my deadlifts or my RDLs, excuse me, because I just like the extra range of motion. Or if the weight is light enough, you can have people just use smaller diameter plates. You can just use 25s. Um, so like she's doing here, she has some 25s on the bar. She can get some extra range of motion. Um, but yeah, so you know, with the RDL, it's paramount that you have really good back extension. Otherwise, you're just kind of doing this weird like spinal flexion curl, um, you know. Uh, and one thing I noticed is that uh, a lot of people with RDLs, they'll get really on the heels. I really like to load mine more on the toes. Um, it kind of helps me feel like I have to fight for position mm-hmm. a little bit more. Um, but yeah, RDLs, RDLs, love them. Um, question uh, from Jean Gloria. Uh, he said, RDL, or said, excuse me, Rip says to do one set of five deadlifts, but I do three sets of five. Could that be too much? Um, it's all contextual. Read Practical Programming, third edition. Um, so in the beginning, you know, more than one set of five deadlifts, probably just overkill given the amount of progress you can get on just one set of five. Um, but eventually in your deadlifting career, you'll have to do more than one set for sure. Um, Chase, what do you think? I'm thinking right now, John is not there and I think he is doing a little bit too much with three sets of five. Um, are you doing three sets of five now, John? Is that what you mean? Or do you mean like theoretically? I'm just going to say he's he's taking it as he is right now, currently. Oh, I misread that then. Okay, cool. That definitely can, can bother the shit out of your hamstrings. Yeah, like if you're doing three sets of five deadlifts, let's say three times a week for some godforsaken reason, and you think you're supposed to increase weight every time, that's just a lot of work, man. Yeah, that's just a lot, you know. Um, doing three... Five. Um, yeah, man. So what you're indicating by the fact that you're getting like you're re-injuring yourself uh, continually is that you're doing too much work somewhere in relationship to how conditioned you are. Um, you know, so you could probably do the amount of deadlifts you're doing, but with a lighter weight, you know, um, or you could keep the weight increasing and then pull the sets down. So it's a ratio that you got to play with. Any more thoughts for uh, John Chase? Yeah, I, I just say me preferably, I would just cut down the volume and just mm-hmm. try to push the intensity a little bit more. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to watch some pause pulls now. Um, this is a, this is a pause pull basically right off the floor. Um, I really like this drill for, for working on chest position, like the halting deadlift. Um, but also basically, you know, kind of mentally staying in the game for longer. Um, this portion of the deadlift for a lot of people is the hardest, like right off the floor. Um, mm-hmm. so if you can get them accustomed to it, it's, it's great mentally, I think. Um, Chase, you said before that you haven't really played around with like a pause pull too much, right? I think I did them like one four week block, but yeah, I never really did it as much as I probably would like to, to kind of get more exposure and to have a little bit more say in it. Mm-hmm. But um, just kind of looking at it, I mean, granted, if you don't have a coach and you don't have someone telling you where you need to actually pause at, I can kind of see how this can kind of get a little bit blurred with just a weird slow deadlift <laughs> whereas like a halting yeah. you you're you're stopping like you are stopping and you can't go any further and you have to put the bar down mm-hmm. so it's it's kind of less to fuck up i think yeah but 
It's very, it's a skilled variation. I remember one time I was doing these with like a near limit load. Um, it was like mid fours. I was doing a two count pause pull and someone was like, man, that was a good fight on the deadlift. I thought that totally froze for a second. They were like, I'm surprised you got that moving again. <laughs> and I was like, that was on purpose. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's not, I'm not that weak. Jeez. Um, yeah, give me some credit. Um, but yeah, I really like, I really like the pause pull. Um, give me a try, Chase. See if, see if you like them for your, for your dudes. Um, yeah. They are definitely stressful like the amount of time your lower back is holding extension is oh, yeah. just straight up a lot um so you have to offset the weight more than you think like keep these pretty high, like on the easier side you know um easier side for sure um and then i think we have a few more deadlift videos uh, this is just a normal double um we saw uh, some deadlifts from this guy a while ago um so we're just checking in here let's see how these go rep one I think the descent could use a little bit of work that was that was sloped yeah, off the bit, legs. A little bit forward. Yeah. Calves are looking juicy, though, dude. That's the important part of the deadlift, I think. What do you think yeah, about like, these, Chase? I like to see his toes out a little bit more. Um, you mm -hmm. can kind of see that the bar is getting out just a little bit. He does a nice job of keeping it on his legs, but um, it's still kind of a little bit too out in front from our standpoint. Um, increase the toe angle. Get the bar back on you. And these will look just fine. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we have any other ones we haven't touched. Um, oh, we do have some footage of, uh, you know what? I'll, I'll put this one up for differences in back extension. Um, these are on different days, but this is someone, uh, they don't practice singles really ever. Um, I'm going to share the screen. That would be helpful. Um, this is a 405 limit pull. They don't practice singles. Um, and then note basically how much the back uh, goes from extension and deflection. Like the person's fighting for back extension for all they're worth. It's a long, shaky pull. Um, and then we can see that. But I would say this is on my end, like a comfortable upper limit on how much I think the back should or can be rounding on a very heavy pull. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm, I am worried about upper back extension, but at the same time, I'm not. Um, I'm more concerned about the low back and hell. I myself, I can't get away with just rounding my upper back a lot. So I'm, I kind of have, you know, this bias to where it's okay in my head, even though it's not in, in some ways, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think that's, do you hit the nail on the head with that is probably the limit. Yeah. And then this is, so this is 25 pounds lighter, for example. So that was, that was four or five. This is three, uh, seven to five. Um, so just basically the difference between the two, um, in terms of back extension, that was fast. So we'll, we'll replay this. Um, but yeah, just then, just to know the difference, like one thing when you're watching your own deadlifts, you know, you'll be able to see differences in weight. You should probably also see differences in back extension. So if you have like a heavy day where you're hitting a heavy triple and some back offs, look at how much your back is actually undergoing rounding, if at all, during that heavy triple. And then you can compare that to some other items through the week. Um, you know, so if all of your, uh, deadlifting just looks like hard as hell, like Ryan's 405 did on the last video probably not too great you kind of want to have some stuff that you can get a little bit more cleanly um what do you think about these deadlifters overall man they're just heavy and uh this is what it's <laughs> gonna look like whenever it's heavy yep heavy heavy that's it Did you see i'm really kind of looking at the dude squatting behind him so look at him oh god like yeah like the perfect like bro squat his nose is aimed completely at the ceiling oh, we see some doing, we see some gyno it's his it's fucking killing. textbook man driving with the chest just ah oh, finishing it Bars popping off his back. Like Even the really cameraman good. got distracted on this one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so he just couldn't stop him from looking at it. Um, but yeah, yeah, clean pulls all around. Um, and I think the only one we haven't shown is a deficit. So let me grab a deficit for us. Um, Here, here's kind of a hot take. So I've kind of had this uh, conversation with some coaches. Um, do you think there's this thing as overextension with a deadlift? Um. For an individual lifter, yes. Uh, conceptually, now, saying, across so like, the board, I don't know if I can agree to that. I mean, I, I by the way, uh, just so we can see what's going on with the video here, um, this is someone deadlifting, I think 395, something like that's on the bar right now. And then for a deficit, what is most commonly used is either a horse stall mat, so like the black part of a deadlift platform, it's typically made from horse stall mats, um, or you could just put some plates on the side or on their side, basically. Um, so like a pretty standard metric is like just stand on a 45 pound plate or like one or two horse stall mats. And then mm -hmm. we can see him doing his thing here. Um, and then we'll we'll get to the overextension question afterwards. It'll be a little bonus tidbit. 
and then one more. So the position for the deficit, the person will almost always have to be more bent over. You know, mm-hmm. um, it's not really a thing where even if they try to get their hips really low and like squat it off the ground, the hips will come up no matter what. You know, um, so if you have a problem with someone who really likes to lower their hips, you can give them a deficit to be like, hey, it's just not going to work no matter what. You know, to really teach that position. And then we'll watch this one more time. Reptos. Mm-hmm. How are you feeling about these chase? I think he's kind of rushing the setup a little bit. Um, For sure. With, with the deadlift, he need or the, the deficit, especially um, making sure that your back is set. Because I think with this, you kind of have, again, that sensation that you are leaned over a little bit more. So you know that your back is going to really work on here. So use that to your advantage with setting your low back. Just squeeze the shit out of it and push. Mm-hmm. That should, like the whole, you know, uh, Rip has an amazing article called um, uh, The Deadlift Mechanics, The Obvious Can Be Obscure. I love that one. I'm going to read it to my children at Christmas Eve, I think. Um, <laughs> right before bedtime. <laughs> yeah, I'll be like, hey, <laughs> we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about hoop tension and belts. Um, but excellent article. Um, but Chase's tidbit, it's kind of the short version. It's like, you just set your back, squeeze like hell. It'll probably move eventually for you. Mm-hmm. Um but Chase, tell us about overextension the deadlift, what you think's going on with it, well, why it exists, kind of, what's kind wrong of with it. Off of, kitty, piggybacking off of what you were saying, like I feel like no, no matter what I've seen in the gym, um, granted, if it's real light, yes, this is kind of an outlier, but if it's pretty heavy or a maximal pull, you can overextend the shit out of your back at the start, and then as the bar is breaking off the floor, it feels like it goes back to neutral. Um, out of overextension. So uh, I really, I really am not focused on it. And I actually will cue to actually overextend the back at times. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, if I have a really flexible woman, again, she's an outlier. We actually have to tell her to round your, your back essentially and push, but that's a very small uh, group of person, people. Uh, So I'm, again, I'm, I'm cueing them to just extend the shit out of the low back. Chase, I need to mail you some internet. Why? Um, you're, you got super blurry. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna put some bandwidth in an envelope and send it to your house. I don't know. I, I finally got internet here, so I don't <laughs> know what the fuck is going on. Um, no, no. For a, for a second there, you got you got like 240p. Um, oh, nice. But yeah, so overextension the deadlift. Um, what we're referring to is you know the amount of rounding or straightening that your spine can get into, um, and then for most people. They can try to, you know, straighten it or arch it backwards as much as they can get. Think like a kid doing a gymnastics bridge that would be really extended. Um, They will just never be able to for a lot of people, you know. Um, But for some people, they definitely can. Um, So when we talk about overextension, we say, is that person arching it too much to the point where it's being detrimental? Um, I think it exists on the individual spectrum because some people can just lose focus with it, if that makes sense. Um, so like I'm very flexible guy, all my RDLs are done to like a five inch deficit. I keep perfect back extension the entire time. Um, if I focus on extending my back as much as I can, because I do, you know, a lot of grappling sports where I'm doing bridging, um, I can extend the ever living shit out of it. It is unproductive for me to do that. Right. Cause I'm focusing so much on extension that I'm almost losing position, you know? Um, I think there are to, you know, to kind of get on the Chris Duffin Kabuki strength bandwagon, um, there are optimal spinal mechanics, um, but really it just kind of refers to the position your back settles into as all of those muscles are pulling as hard as they can. Um, So, you know, like Chase was saying, if you try to get into as much extension as you possibly can, as you start pulling, you'll just go back to what relative neutral is, you know, or what relative neutral is for you. Um, So I I definitely agree on that. You know, Um, I think I... The, the thing that I really focus on is consistency in intent. I don't know if you think about that as mainly intent chase, but it's like the actual yeah. result of the extension I'm less focused on. I'm more focused on what they're intending to do with their back. Um, Cause you'll meet like some older people who it's like, they're not going to be able to dramatically change the shape of their spine in the setup, mm-hmm. but the intent of them, you know, squeezing their chest up is what matters. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I think I'm, I think I'd land on ex- overextension exists. I only care about it in fringe cases. It almost solves itself. Um, yeah. It's almost like the the hip height in the pull. Like people will, you know, say that starting strength has their pulling mechanics wrong because people start with their hips really low and then they shoot up as they're starting. It's like, yeah, that's yeah. that's what we're saying. You know, yeah. um, it it will return to the relevant position whenever you're actually doing the thing. Um, what do you think, Chase? Crock of shit? No, I, mean, I I agree. Um, okay, just kind of. 
wanted to talk about this a little bit more. And plus, I think a lot of people have that question of, um, look, you can you can feel it on a squat, you can feel it on a bench, but with the deadlift, your back is kind of loaded a little bit differently to where mm-hmm. you really don't feel it, and you can kind of get away with it at the same time. Um, but yeah, you anyone who's ever done it on the squat, they know that I can't do this because it hurts like a son of a bitch. Um, and they're always worried about it, but that same person, they can get away with that on the, on a deadlift, I think. Yeah. If the deadlift is sufficiently light, you can get away with it. Yeah. You can get away with it. I think on the squat almost, um, you know, it's almost everyone's, uh, pelvis will tuck under a little bit, um, at the bottom of the squat. Um, and then that's the, the butt wink, but butt wink thing. Don't really worry about it. No one cares. It's the intent of keeping your back is, is, you know, steadfast as you can. Um, not being really loosey goosey with it. Um, you know, like a lot of, I've noticed a lot of people who will have the capacity for what some people call overextension. They'll really do that on the squat. And then they'll be worried about butt wink at the bottom when in reality, it's just kind of, you know, your back's just doing what it has to do. Don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not hyper concerned about it. What I will say though, is that I am concerned about it on like, uh, for some people for the press and for the bench, um, they try to arch just as much as humanly possible. And it's like, you just don't need to do that right now, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like just, you know, chill out. Mm-hmm. How often are you saying chill out to your lifters? Just relax, man. Um, here pretty recently, uh, it's been quite a few because we just had peak week at our gym. So we, oh, cool. we allowed everyone to kind of hit some heavy numbers and kind of what their goals were. Mm-hmm. Um, more it was in the sense of, look, man, you are overthinking this number, this weight. <laughs> you literally, this is only five or 10 pounds heavier. Like I'm not going to let mm-hmm. you fail. We've selected numbers based off of how well everything's been kind of moving you'll be okay. So that, yeah, here recently I've been shrink man more than starting strength coach. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's half the job. That's I, uh-huh. I, I tell a lot of people every week. Yeah, it's totally fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we got some comments about overextension. Uh, Mr. Dr. Sir, uh, so many titles. He said overextending my back in the squat gave me a lot of back pain. Um, yeah. Loaded flexion and extension can be irritating for some folks. Mm-hmm. Um, he said it went away as soon as he fixed it. Um, and then coffee, uh, he said, for me, overextension looks like neutral. It goes back into flexion during the pull. Um, send it a video, man. That sounds cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, uh, into flexion is probably your true neutral, if I had to bet. He may, yeah, he may be a bigger guy to where it looks like. Mm-hmm. You're not seeing like the typical bowl of his low back, but I don't know. Yeah. I had a very intimate moment with one of the starting training coaches at the first platform exam. Um so uh, I was setting up for the deadlift and I just kind of did like the floor breaker drill. And he was mm-hmm. like, it may look like his lower back is rounded, but if you feel inside of the crevice, <laughs> you'll see that it's straight. And he just like karate chops basically right onto my spine in between the valley between erector and erector and oh, like yeah. wiggles his hand a little bit. No one's ever done that to me while I'm deadlifting before. It was a very unique sensation for someone to be great. Like it was, it was really right at my butt, basically, you know, right at yeah. the bottom of my, uh, he's like played with your toxics a little bit. Yeah, exactly. He's just filled around the lower back and he's like, yeah, you guys can come back here. And some people are like, oh yeah, they're just looking around. <laughs> Pretty good. I'm just sitting there straining, just picking my butt up <laughs> as much as I can. Um, no coffee. He said, um, talking about just thoracic flexion, not lumbar. Interesting. Yeah. I've never seen overextension of the thoracic oh, yeah, spine it's the thoracic spine has naturally a kyphotic curve I, uh, you may be talking about cervical overextension um but yeah g lock in the chat he said uh he said my non-specific lower back pain really only flares up when i spend too much time warming up for the deadlift that's an interesting one what do you think about that chase hmm. um you could be doing something wrong in your warm-ups but you're not doing it while you're doing your work sets um, i have some people who Literally, um, they're doing almost a different technique on their warm-ups because it's light and they just want to get through it versus on their, their work sets where they're actually thinking about it. They're doing what we need them to do. Um, so if you're kind of half-assing your warm-ups and not really treating them with as much um, gravity as you need to, yeah, it, it could be the, the problem here. Yeah, that's interesting. So I think if it's... 
Yeah, because it's almost the inverse of what we normally hear because people say, you know, like if I warm up too quickly, the working sets will hurt. I would say that it's probably a positional difference um, between your warm up set and your working set. Um, So if you're just really not caring about your back position on a warm up and then, you know, you're caring about it on a working set or it could be kind of the inverse of that. So it's like you may be, quote unquote, overextending or getting into too much extension for your personal preference on a warm up. And then whenever you get to your working set, you're it basically more of a comfortable position, you know, and that's why it's, it's not really really bothering you on the um uh on the working set um and then the other thing i that it could possibly be is just you know like you are almost i don't want to say running out of physical resources you know but it's just like hey you know you've already done squats for the day you've already done something else if you add in let's say six sets of warm-up on the deadlift if you're you know working up to you know 300 some pounds or something like that um the extra volume could just be irritating um that's a that's an interesting one to think about any other comments going on here any parting shots, Chase, that you want to talk about? No. Um, no. No? All right. Chase, the si- the silent Chase monk. Everyone knows that for sure. How long are you letting the beard grow out for, man? I don't have a beard. It's just the goatee. How are you letting out your, your Shakespearean goatee grow out for? I don't know. Um, I Dude, I wish I had like the nasty, burly, like just wolfman facial hair so I can get like some nasty, cool. Like I want the mustache that turns into like the mutton chops. I want just like some goofy looking facial hair, man. That's, that's good. You should just go actually full goatee, like, you know, tan cargo shorts, white socks up to like the knee. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? Just look like you work at a blockbuster 25 years oh, yeah. ago. I think that's the move, but just also huge. <laughs> yeah. All right. Zachary justice. Adam I don't think Lane. that's your real last name, Zachary. He said Adam Langman got a beard. Who's Adam Langman? Anybody know? I have no idea. I'm going to Google this on stream. We'll see how this goes. Adam Langman. I'm just going to dox some people, man. I don't know who Adam Langman is. Um, Pete says thanks as always. Yeah, I think that's it for the stream. We're losing steam here. Um, but yeah, thank you all for uh, for showing up and for the questions in the chat. Um, oh, Teo has one last question. We'll get this and we'll head out. Um, Teo said, I got some quad tendonitis in one knee. It gets better with a rest, probably because of knee slide. Any exercises or lift you do to strengthen the knee? What do you think, Chase? That's a positional error, man. You got to correct your squat, making sure that you don't have any knee slide. Um, you're doing everything that needs to be done um, to effectively make your knee better while squatting. Yeah, I think like if you, so basically, you know, what we can say with knee slide is, you know, like the, as you are letting the bar far, fall forward of midfoot, the knees are going farther forward of the midfoot, which is putting relatively more load on them. So it's like, is the knee moving deleterious? No. I wouldn't say that moving your knee is necessarily harmful. What we would say is that loading your knee in a way that you're not used to or prepared for, no bueno. Um, So we want to control the knee position. That way you can control the amount of loading on the knee. Um, You know, so I would think like vertical chins sitting really far back and behind you in terms of like strengthening the knee, you know, just, you know, squat and pull and then it's totally fine. Um, do you need facial hair to be an effective starting strength coach as a man? I don't know. It's a prerequisite, man. If you're not a starting strength coach and, uh, it's because you don't have facial hair. Even our women have facial hair. You just don't Mm -hmm. see it. Yep. They're all, they're all just jacked up, man. Bunch Mm -hmm. of tests. They're just growing the stubble out. Um, yeah, yeah, this is the last, I think three or four days for the mustachio for me. I had a mustache going for the past week and a half. I love it. I miss the mustache. Um, but yeah, mustache will be gone by next stream. Um, I think that's it for today. Uh, yeah, find us on our social medias and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you have a comment or a, a topic that you want us to get through, uh, leave it in the comments and we'll get through it over the next few weeks. All right. Thanks guys. See ya.